This presentation discusses current and modern learning environments. The classroom of today is evolving. Although the desks in neat rows may seem to mirror the classrooms of the last 100 years, the methods used are changing. So the environment may look the same, but be used just a little differently. Notice all of the things in this first grade classroom. Looking at the photo on the right, you can see a smart board on the right side of the picture. The smart board, a touch screen, allows students to work with technology every day. The step stool allows them to manipulate objects on the board. As an example, students may complete a learning exercise in working with a clock by sliding the hands of the clock to the appropriate time. Or they may divide a pie into fractions and remove one quarter to demonstrate math problem solving. This is a precursor to learning to draw on touchscreens for more sophisticated applications like architectural or electrical design. Also notice all of the things around the smart board, such as shapes, color names, graphs, money, and manipulatives. We'll talk about these in a minute. The classroom is rich with print and books. Children in the primary grades have not yet developed proficiency with using a dictionary. So working in a print-rich environment gives them access to the words they use every day. Further, books are available at a variety of reading levels. In first grade, students are still learning to read, and at all grades, students should always be working at their just right reading level. Books should give a little challenge, but never be so difficult as to cause frustration. As students learn to read, they progress through a variety of reading levels at a very personal pace. This makes it important to have the resources very accessible. Further, opportunities for reading have expanded greatly. Authors are producing a much broader range of just-right books, including fiction and nonfiction, at all reading levels. Creating readers also means having books of interest. Let's take a look at some of the specific facets of the room. First, many classrooms come together on a rug space to have a morning meeting. Morning meeting is really an integration of many areas, science, math, reading, writing, speaking, and listening, to name a few. In the next few slides, the various parts of the morning meeting and the rest of the day are shared by content area. In addition to the morning meeting rug space, another important space is the reading table. It's one of the many spaces and methods to teach reading skills. This is where small group instruction and reading happens with one teacher and three to six students. Teachers work with students who are at or near similar reading levels and working on developing some of the same skills. This small group personalized instruction ensures ongoing development of reading skills and is an opportunity for teachers to monitor that growth. Groups change regularly as readers develop in order to ensure that students reach their full potential. You can see some of the tools related to reading instruction in the pictures to the right. Book baskets, big books for whole class sharing, and write on wipe off boards for sharing words or strategies. Students learn decoding strategies in addition to phonics, spelling, and vocabulary in order to learn to read. Decoding strategies give students specific ways to problem solve when they come to a word they don't know. Decoding strategies include looking at the pictures, getting lips ready for the first sound, chunking, and stretching out the word. Each strategy is associated with an animal character in order to help students remember all the strategies. In order to read, first grade readers may gain clues about the printed words on a page by looking at the pictures. We call this using our eagle eyes. And first grade readers may decode words by getting their lips ready to make the sounds. We call this using our fish lips. You can see from the bottom left picture, there are a lot of strategies to figuring out the words on a page. Think about reading an especially difficult text as an adult, a law book, a medical text, or a legal document. Do you use any of these strategies? While students are learning the words on the page through decoding strategies, they are also learning what the words mean when they're together in a sentence or a paragraph. We call these comprehension strategies. Again, using the same thinking, animal characters symbolize the strategies. So Krabby the Connector 
ask students to think about connections they have to the text in order to understand the text better. Or, Rocky the Raccoon, with his eyes focused, helps young readers visualize the scene. Together, decoding and comprehension strategies help young readers learn to read and then move on to reading to learn. In the area of writing, students are engaged in writing workshop. Teachers model a short lesson, maybe on writing a topic sentence. Students see the teacher do a sample and work with her to create another sample. Then they practice with a friend. Finally, they're released to practice on their own. This method of I do, we do, you do allows young writers to practice writing, both the art of developing their thoughts and organizing them, as well as the conventions like grammar, punctuation, and spelling. We believe that writers develop their skills by practicing with guidance at every step. Just like a great free throw shooter learns with a coach, practicing with friends, and working hard on their own. And remember, because our elementary learners may not use a dictionary just yet, they are immersed in a print-rich environment. The large picture is a sample of a word wall, a big dictionary that is available and open at all times. In the top right, a sample of some common first grade words for the letter S are presented as a snapshot of the word wall. In the bottom right, students are studying word families. For example, the bottom row is the at family. Each picture symbolizes a word that uses the same word family, bat, mat, hat, cat, and rat. The commonality of all the words is that they end in a-t. Understanding word families, blends, digraphs, and many other facets of our English language helps students both in reading and writing acquisition. In the first grade classroom, you'll also see pieces and parts of science going on. On the left, you can see a center. Centers are used to teach. Students may be self-directed learners at a center, work in pairs, or sometimes in small groups. On the right, you can see a part of the morning meeting. This scientific inquiry in graph is about what kind of pets students have. In analyzing the graph, students learn math skills as well as scientific analysis. They may postulate a theory before collecting data, and then their theory is proven or not. All of this is a part of learning to think like a scientist. Just looking around the room, we can see that the decorations are not really decorations at all. They are all about math. The clock in the room is a lesson in reading a clock with a minute hand versus a digital clock. Young students may see both kind of clocks at home and school and need to understand how to translate between the two types of clocks. The odds and even counting monster teaches students the difference between odd and even numbers. And it also teaches students how to skip count in order to solve math equations. The fill it in chart shows students the many opportunities in understanding a number line and counting up or back. These skills are utilized as students begin to learn basic addition and subtraction where they count up to add and count back to subtract as two possible strategies. Math also involves learning to count coins. It's terribly confusing to young learners that a nickel is bigger but worth less than a dime. Students can see and practice their counting. And finally, the calendar is an infinite source of math. And like many of the other math decorations, it's an integration of science. Learning the weather and seasons works well with learning to count the days in a month, a week, or hours in a day. So we know students are learning to read, write, be good scientists, and of course mathematicians, but they're also learning a great deal socially. Again, what appear to be posters or decorations are really a focus on promoting positive, healthy social interactions. The rug rules demonstrate appropriate choices when seated in the morning meeting or other rug time with the group. Washing your hands shows how to appropriately take care of and help the class with good hygiene at the sink. The tattle monster begins to help first graders distinguish between a tattle and sharing because something is a safety issue. It is that valuable social problem solving very young students learn. 
Additionally, young students may always need some strengthening when it comes to personal space and our cultural norm for a few feet between people interacting. And finally on the right, the Bucket Fillers Bulletin Board awards those positive social interactions. Celebrating success is an important way to ensure students continue to demonstrate positive social skills. Every classroom also has a teacher space, an adult-only space to plan, store a purse, keep some supplies separate from student supplies, keep schedules, and ensure that confidential records are truly kept confidential. This is a sample of a teacher space used for both teacher and classroom supplies. You can see the tub storing items for future science and math centers, as well as big books used for whole class demonstrations in the center two pictures. With 20 to 25 students and a teacher living eight hours each day in about 900 square feet, there has to be some organization. Moving around these pictures clockwise, starting in the upper left, you can see a baking sheet used in a unique way as a lunch selection magnet board. The cubbies hold student mail and homework, working much like your mailbox at home. Crayons, pencils, and other supplies are clearly labeled and again offer us an example of the importance of a print-rich environment. The far right shows a picture of the schedule for the day. Again, because many of our young students are just blossoming into readers, they need both a visual and print-rich schedule to know where they are going. Finally, you can see a variety of manipulatives. These are used for counting in math or sorting for science. Students manipulating small objects helps them learn, and again, we can integrate valuable social skills like cooperation and collaboration. And, of course, the organization of our classrooms extend into the hallways. In the winter, we fill these areas with hats, mittens, jackets, snow pants, boots, and scarves to prepare students for outdoor recess in the snow. In the fall, PE shoes are stored for use on the indoor floors. So, now, when you look at these pictures of a typical classroom in our current use, you may look at the room a little differently. Do you notice the print-rich environment? Why is that important? Can you see the books? Why are lots of leveled books important for learning? How about the decorations? Are they just prettying up the room, or is each one valuable to learning? And these bulletin boards, are they just for decoration? Or do they serve a valuable purpose in developing social skills and providing a word wall for young writers? Finally, although we haven't been able to share each and every facet of the first grade classroom, we appreciate the opportunity to share some of the important parts. Thank you, Mrs. Ferkovich, for sharing Room 12 with us. This section of the presentation will focus on what we know about how students learn and how the physical environment can support learning. Let's begin our discussion with the four realms of, of human experience. These four realms are spatial, psychological, physiological, and behavioral. Take a minute to read through the words I use to describe each realm. I used positive words and terms, but you could add the opposite terms, dark versus bright, or troublesome versus soothing. Considering these realms, take 30 seconds to reflect on your own school experiences. Speaking of universal human experiences, while we don't normally think of restrooms as learning environments, I would like to begin with this example that demonstrates new ways to think about organizing space. The photo on the left has a traditional public restroom. Without seeing it, we know that there is a bank of sinks with mirrors above on the wall across from the stalls. 
What I'd like to draw your attention to, though, is how much extra space is frequently found between the stalls and the sinks. We also know that there are two areas in schools where students feel a little less safe or maybe uncomfortable. These two places are in the restrooms and the hallways. We also know that children who tease or bully other children seldom do it in the presence of teachers and other adults. Now take a look at the drawing on the right. This is an entirely different restroom, but it serves to make a point. What if school restrooms were more like bathrooms at home? Note that the two rooms on the right each have a full door, a toilet, a sink, and a paper towel dispenser. The walkway leading to these home-like restrooms is more narrow than the space outside of the stalls in the traditional restroom on the left. In fact, the outside entryway could be a glass door and side window because the only thing students would do in that area is to wait their turn for a bathroom. This allows for passive monitoring of the area, something that is not feasible in a traditional restroom. The big idea is about looking at the space we currently have differently, reconfiguring space to better fit our purposes. Which leads me to remind everyone that schools and classrooms are the means to our ends, which of course is student learning. One of the things that makes this district so special is our process for engaging the community to help determine what our students should know and be able to do when they graduate and move on to the next stage of their lives. We call this engagement process Framework for Our Future. The first one was held in 1999 and the second in 2009, with smaller check-ins in both 2004 and 2014. You can find a link to the DeForest Area School District Learning Goals, which we call End in Mind Student Learning, on our website right below this presentation. There are two types of learning goals that the school community identified, personal and interpersonal. Under personal effectiveness, we have complex thinker, self-directed learner, knowledgeable person, and healthy person. Under interpersonal effectiveness, we have effective communicator, collaborative worker, and socially responsible citizen. You can find more descriptors for each of the learning goals on our website. I'd also like to point out that there are other pieces of the educational puzzle besides space considerations, like schools and classrooms. Some of these other components are the curriculum, daily schedules, school year calendars, budget planning, hiring practices, and more. All of these should align with and support the ends of student learning. Before I start in on the heart of what we know about modern learning environments, I want to point out that there isn't a right learning environment that will be a silver bullet for us, but there are some principles of school design that we will want to take into account. I'm taking much of what you'll see and hear from two books, From the Campfire to the Holodeck, Creating Engaging and Powerful 21st Century Learning Environments by David Thornburg, and The Language of School Design, Design Patterns for 21st Century Schools by Nair, Fielding, and Lackney. Please click on the link below this presentation and look at the green side of this document that lists 29 design patterns going down the left side of the page. These are cross-referenced with six categories that go across the top of the page. I'm not going to address all 29 design patterns, but I will address six of them. I've already talked about home-like bathrooms, but I'm also going to address teachers as professionals and four brain-based patterns, including multiple intelligences, campfire spaces, watering hole spaces, and cave spaces. Take a second look at two of the photos that were shared with you earlier in this presentation. I'd like you to look at them through the lens of a professional workspace. If I were to go meet with the first grade teachers at Windsor Elementary School at the end of the school day, after students are dismissed, we would meet at the table on the left. There is only one adult-sized chair in this room. Now imagine further that one of the teachers is 55 years old and has a creaky hip, and another teacher is 5 foot 10 inches tall. This is their collaborative workspace. One of the things that makes education a fascinating profession are all the new things we're learning about how students learn. Just because a teacher graduated from college 2, 12, or 22 years ago, it doesn't mean they know everything there is to know about teaching and learning. They need a space to learn and improve their craft on a regular basis also. 
This slide lists nine different types of intelligence that have been identified over the past generation or so. The first two, linguistic and logical mathematical, are the two most common types of intelligences that were prominent in the last century, but many thinkers believe the other seven are equally important. If you look at the blue side of the document from an earlier slide, you'll see 20 different school spaces cross-referenced with these nine intelligences listed across the top. You will note that the traditional classroom at the top is the least flexible of these spaces when viewed through the lens of multiple intelligences. Please stick with me here as I take a little detour. If we're going to address learning environments, I think it's important to talk about what we mean by learning. I ask the question, is the human brain more like a sponge or more like a sieve or filter? The answer is that our brains are more like a sieve than a sponge. We like to think that little kids soak everything up and frequently they do repeat things they've heard that we would rather they hadn't, but by and large we don't remember every experience we've ever had. To oversimplify just a bit, there are three types of memory. Sensory memory, working memory, and long-term memory. Sensory memory is very short, just a matter of seconds. Most of what we experience, see, feel, hear, and taste, is quickly forgotten. Working memory is longer, in the range of minutes to days or weeks. An example of working memory is remembering why you left one room in your house and went to another room to retrieve something. Another example is if you've ever stayed at a motel or hotel for more than a day. Most of us can remember our room number for the duration of our stay, but then we quickly forget it. And rightfully so, there is no reason to store the number of a room you stayed in years ago. Now long-term memory, this is the memory that we are primarily concerned with in schools. What can students remember and do weeks, months, and years after they first learned it? And furthermore, can they use that knowledge or skill in a new or unique situation when needed? So, back to our original question. Can the design of our physical spaces help students learn? At this point, I would like to introduce three metaphors, or shortcuts, for talking about learning spaces. These are campfire spaces, watering hole spaces, and cave spaces. Campfires are home to storytelling, a place where people gather to hear stories told by others. Of course, today the campfire has been replaced by chalkboards, overhead projectors, and PowerPoint presentations. But the underlying teaching method remains the same. Teachers hold the knowledge, package it, and deliver it to their students. Watering holes are places for social learning among peers. This learning takes place through conversations, not lectures. Today, the watering hole might be the water cooler or copy machine at work, or the hallways and lunchroom at school. Finally, caves are home to reflective learning. This process is solitary and involves self-directed meaning-making with outside resources, including books and websites. Here are some pictures of campfire spaces, spaces where people gather to hear stories told by others. The painting on the top left is over 500 years old and shows some of the students not paying attention, which is not that different than students in the 21st century. The bottom left has a picture of a huge lecture hall and the top middle has a current traditional classroom. The bottom center photo has flexible walls and flexible seating that still uses a campfire style space. While the color green on the photo on the right isn't one I would choose, the carpeted steps were clearly designed as a campfire space, but the students using it in the picture are using it as cave spaces. This slide has photos of students of all ages working and planning with their peers in various watering hole spaces. Finally, these photos demonstrate different designers' visions of creating nooks and crannies for students to work independently. The black and white photo has study carols of the type you could find in college libraries in the middle of the last century. One of the things I'd like to emphasize is that each of these three spaces, campfire, watering hole, and cave spaces, have been used by people for centuries. They are not new concepts. 
What is new is the recognition that all three spaces are necessary if students are to reach higher levels of learning, not just the campfire space that held such sway in the 1900s. Revisiting your thoughts from your school experiences from several minutes ago, which space or spaces best supported your learning in the past? Which support your current learning? The challenge for the members of the Community Advisory Committee is to incorporate principles of modern learning environments into their facility planning. In closing, the takeaway message is flexibility. Flexible furniture and flexible spaces. How can we use the spaces in our schools to prepare students for college and the world of work?